finally, we're going to ask this important question of where does the error signal come from? The error term, the target value, is what makes error-driven learning so much more powerful than Hebbian learning. But it raises this really important question of like, where does that come from? How does that, how do we get these target signals in the first place? And so this diagram shows the simplest case up here, the explicit teacher that, you know, you might see something and then you produce some output and say, you think, oh, that looks like a pear. And then you hear, no, that's actually an apple. And so you're, oh, well, there's a difference between what I heard. Uh, somebody corrected me that an explicit teacher provides this contrasting input, the target signal that uh, ends up being the plus phase. And I can now correct what I label that item in the future. So this is kind of what people picture, but there's just very few instances in which you get these kind of explicit training signals, somebody correcting your overall output and giving you the right answer. However, there are ways of getting these target signals that are much more prevalent and, and essentially free. And one of the most important ones is predictive learning. And this is shown over here where now you have uh, an input, some visual input, maybe it's a car, uh, and then you actually engage in developing a prediction of what you're, what that's going to look like next. You actually get to see what happens. So assuming uh, that inputs in the world are changing over time, this process of trying to predict what you're going to see next can provide a very important, just constant set of training signals. And interestingly, we're constantly moving our eyes around, kind of generating these need to predict what we're going to see next. And one indication that we are kind of generating these implicit predictions can be had by just kind of gently tweaking your eyeball. And when you do that, it might gross you out, but you can kind of see, especially if you close the other eye, the world moves, okay? But when you move your eyes, it doesn't move. And so that is an indication that we're, we're actually, there's an important difference there. We can predict the effects of our internally generated eye movements. We've had a lot of practice doing that. And therefore, it kind of stabilizes the world. And that tells us one, one clue that we are doing this predictive learning. And it's also a very important source of potential error-driven learning signals. Every frame in that movie-like unfolding of the world contains very important physics regularities, uh, lighting, all kinds of you know human behavior, everything um, that we kind of know about the world can be cast as a form of prediction about what's going to happen next. And so this is a potentially very rich source of training signals. And we'll talk in a moment about how we think the brain may capitalize on those forms of uh, predictive error-driven learning. Um, there's a form of this uh, predictive learning in which you're generating predictions across modalities, which is another rich opportunity. So if you see a duck, then you might predict that you're going to hear a quack. And in fact, uh, if you do, then that confirms your prediction. If you don't, and instead you hear something strange like a bark or a, a, a purr, then you think, well, that's a strange duck. So um, you can uh, also learn about kind of cross-modal predictions. And given that we have our different sensory modalities, there's a lot of opportunity for registration across these modalities. And if you've seen young children, you may have noticed that sometimes they just get fascinated by kind of watching their hands move. And in part, that's a cross-modal prediction between their uh, somatosensory feelings of feeling their hands moving, but also seeing them. And so that's another kind of cross-modal prediction. And that also ties in with our last one here, which is when you're making motor actions, you're actually behaving in the world. That's another occasion for generating predictions. So you can predict the immediate outcome of motor actions. And again, these saccades that we just talked about are one very, very high frequency example. We saccade basically almost every 200 milliseconds. That number is actually significant, as we'll see in a second. Um, and that's a, a vast source of uh, error-driven predictive error-driven learning signals. Um, but obviously, every time we reach, we miss what we're reaching for. That's an error. And so our, our hand doesn't go to where we expected. That, that's represented visually, somatosensorily. And, and so we have lots of sources of kind of errors relative to our expectations.
about what happens when we generate different motor actions. This form of kind of motor outcome prediction is also called uh, a forward model. And it's something that people who do uh, research on motor learning very much think is happening. And we'll see in chapter seven that we think that the cerebellum is one brain area that's particularly important for generating and learning these forward models of the world. And it may be, in fact, that the cerebellum works closely with the cortex, in fact, can train the cortex uh, about these kind of predictive learning outcomes. So we've been doing some work recently looking at a uh, circuit through the thalamus that can support this form of visual predictive learning. It's a very interesting kind of peculiar pattern of neural connectivity that seems to be crying out for some kind of explanation, and we think this is a, a plausible one. Uh, layer 5 intrinsic bursting cells in these deep layers of the primary visual cortex send these really peculiar strong driver inputs into these neurons in the thalamus and in particular we're talking about the pulvinar which is the higher level association area of the thalamus and that pathway is really striking it, it only has like one or two synapses um, on an axon whereas most axons typically have like thousands and they're very strong. Furthermore, neurons that, that originate these uh, burst only every 100 milliseconds. So they're mostly quiet and then they have this little burst of a few uh, uh, rapid fire spikes and then they're quiet again and then they burst every 100 milliseconds. And then the other interesting part of the circuit is these projections from layer six, the, another layer in the deep layers of the cortex and these are more kind of top down. They come from the higher level areas that are actually interacting with the, the pulvinar. And they're, in contrast, very weak and much more numerous than these feed forward driver inputs. Sherman and Guillory describe them as modulatory projections, but we think that they actually might be the source of predictions. And so we're thinking that the uh, higher level top down projections are driving a prediction and then that is compared in the plus phase against this feed forward strong driver input which comes from lower level areas and therefore is kind of more of a ground truth bottom up signal of this is what actually happened here and then this was your prediction just prior to that about what you thought what was going to happen and so that provides a nice explanation for why you want these two different kinds of pathways this is what actually learns. It's plastic. There's many more of them. It requires integration of many different signals to come up with a good prediction. Whereas this is just a kind of very strong built-in bottom-up kind of like, here's what happened kind of signal. You don't need that to learn. It just kind of tells you what happened. And so our overall uh, picture here is that this circuit, this pulvinar layer of the thalamus is acting somewhat like a projection screen. You're sort of projecting your predictions onto it of what you think is going to happen next. And then every 100 milliseconds, that feed-forward driving burst comes in and says, here's what actually did happen. And in fact, that burst is critical to allow you to represent the prediction at a time when there isn't any bottom-up input coming in. Okay, So when that bursting is not happening, you're representing a prediction, and you essentially need some time to generate and, and represent that prediction if you just have always the right answer that you can't make a prediction. You can only make a prediction if you don't at some point have the right answer sitting there. And so the fact that these neurons are also bursting is essential for them, uh, for the circuit to be able to support a kind of predictive learning process. And so uh, this kind of alternating screen, this kind of flickering screen we imagine um, uh, it goes back and forth between prediction, outcome, prediction, outcome, prediction, outcome, every 100 milliseconds according to those bursting cycles. This is what we think is actually driving learning in the, at least in the posterior cortex uh, predominantly. And it's a great source of error-driven learning signals. And again, if we can actually predict all the different complicated things that unfold coming in through our visual senses, and, and in fact, these projection screens presumably exist we know they exist for all these other sensory modalities, um, then we can actually learn, presumably, a lot about the world. And so we have nice models that have taken this uh, circuit, incorporated it, and shown that just through the same kinds of error-driven learning mechanisms that we've just been looking at, they can actually learn interesting things about the world through this predictive learning process. So it does seem to work. And this is a picture of one of these models.
we've actually incorporated a lot about the visual system uh, and including the kind of what versus where separation. There's a lot of important details about how this model works and how these different pathways interact. And these were necessary to get the model to learn uh, high level abstract representations of visual object categories. Um, but they are all based on this fundamental idea that you are alternating between these phases of a minus phase of prediction followed by a plus phase where this kind of bottom-up driver input drives uh, this bursting activity onto the pulmonar. Uh, and again, uh, the top-down predictions are coming not only from the immediate kind of areas that are being uh, directly uh, connected with these bottom-up areas, but actually we think there's a large convergence of top-down signals coming from, from a lot of different areas that help contribute to the prediction. And then all of those areas also receive a reciprocal projection back up from the pulvinar. And in fact, the pulvinar is one of the most widely connected areas in the brain. And so it really does, uh, is it well situated to play this role of this kind of projection screen. And so one interesting kind of tantalizing idea is that in fact, this Cartesian theater that people often uh, use in somewhat in a derisive tone to talk about our kind of naive subjective uh, perceptions of what the nature of consciousness is like may in fact have a basis in this uh, kind of internal projection screen in the pulvinar nucleus of our thalamus. Screen some Cartesian theater sitting inside our head. Uh, one of the problems with that is it implies a certain amount of duality, but in fact, what if the cortex is the part that's conscious that we're aware of, and the thalamus by itself is not something we're directly aware of, but rather is serving this role as essentially a projection screen. That would actually imply exactly this kind of Cartesian duality. And so in fact, maybe our subjective experience matches the form of predictive error-driven learning that we're actually using in the brain. So lots of interesting ideas. Uh, this is a sort of recent uh, work we've been trying to publish for many years, and I think the paper will soon be resubmitted and hopefully see the light of day soon.